A child actor, jaded, depressed, and perpetually high, decided to embark on a journey of mass violence in order to please his inner demons, planning to go after the Prime Minister of Canada himself. I'm sure that a lot of you out there find it very interesting when a celebrity commits a crime, and even more so, we all seem to take a bigger interest when it's a child actor gone wrong. This case really combines both of those things. Ryan Grantham was born in 1998, some sources say 1997, out in Squamish, British Columbia in the lovely land of Canada. He had his mother, Barbara, his unnamed father, and his sister, Lisa, there to serve as his family. Ryan is mainly known, aside from what happens in today's incident, for being a child actor and voice actor. As a young kid, he started practicing acting. It got to the point where he was taking it seriously enough to enroll in schools that specialized in training child actors. It wasn't long before he was working in the entertainment industry, starting his career at age 9 back in 2007. Ryan's first film debut was in The Secret of the Nutcracker in 2007, where he played the role of a character named Billy. It wasn't long before he was debuting in some more major productions, a lot of which you may have seen or at least heard of. I'll admit that I haven't personally seen, well, any of those, but the titles sound familiar. Over the years, he had over 30 credits to his name. In 2009, he had a role in The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, and then in 2010, he ended up playing a character in Diary of a Wimpy Kid. The character he played was, apparently, a kid playing a Nintendo DS who was pretending to be a bush. Okay, I, I don't know what's going on here. Feel free to explain in the comments if you've seen the movie. He played a part in a few episodes of Supernatural, iZombie, and Becoming Redwood. Hi, I'm Ryan Grantham, and uh, I'm playing the role of Redwood. I think determination is one of the biggest things a person can have, and I think because of Redwood, I've definitely grown in determination, so that's definitely going to stick with me. However, it seems like most people know him from his role in Riverdale, which is a weird adult take on the Archie comics. In the fourth season of the show, which aired in 2019, he appeared in one episode as a kid named Jeffrey Augustine just to steal a truck and kill Luke Perry. It seems that his character in Riverdale and one more in a made-for-TV movie called Undercover Cheerleader were his last ever acting roles. It's now one year later in March of 2020. Ryan is now 21 years old. He's studying at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Ryan was big into guns. He was an experienced gun user and was a member of a gun club. For those of you who don't know, yeah, you can get guns in Canada, it's just harder. However, not all was going well, and that's kind of an understatement. By the time he entered young adulthood, Ryan was smoking a metric butt-ton of weed and was watching a bunch of gore videos on the internet pretty much daily. His grades were suffering, plummeting fast as he started skipping school more and more. Eventually, he just completely dropped out of Simon Fraser University. He was going through spells of self-loathing, an overall sense of hopelessness, and the urge to commit violence on a mass scale, an urge that only got worse over time. I think you're coming to realize that security is important in life, in all aspects of life, especially online. Thankfully, there's Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider, with over 30 million downloads to date. This VPN is 100% open source, meaning that the code is available to the public so that anyone can take a look under the hood and examine just how secure and private the service really is. Unlike some other VPN providers, they never record or store user data, and their no-logs policy has been proven multiple times in court. You'll be hard-pressed to find any other VPN that's this transparent. Private internet access works by hiding your IP address and encrypting your internet connection. By doing this, it shields your digital life from the eyes of the internet service provider, network administrators, and even government censors. Private internet access also comes with a whole lot of entertainment benefits. It works with all major streaming services, so you can access more content than ever before from anywhere in the world. This VPN even has 50 servers in 50 US states. Need to look like you're surfing the web from Oklahoma? There's an IP address for that. Maybe you need to visit a website that can only be accessed from Alaska for some reason. Well, they've got an IP address for that too. Why is this such a big deal? With IP addresses available in all 50 states, you can. Avoid sporting event blackouts if your state's local network opts out of rights to televise the game. Be able to access local websites which are blocked from outside of state borders, including local news stations and online banking details. And watch TV premieres before they show in your time zone and avoid spoilers. Private internet access is available for all platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Android, Linux, iOS, and many more. 
Signing up for private internet access is risk-free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 customer support is available. By using the link in my description, my viewers can grab an 82% discount on private internet access. That's only $12.11 a month, and you also get three extra months completely for free. Go ahead, give it a shot. Ryan was very insecure about what his family thought of him, namely his mother. He was very worried that his mom would find out about his lackluster performance at his university and, in addition to that, about all of the weed he was constantly smoking. In his mind, things got darker and darker as his mental health got worse and worse. For months, he continued watching gore videos on the deep web as he struggled with the urge to kill not only himself, but everyone else around him. Unfortunately, despite knowingly dealing with these urges, he continued to buy more guns during this period. As the urges to kill got stronger, he started upping the ante in his own mind, coming up with increasingly broad-scoped plans as to what he was going to do. He thought about committing acts of mass violence at possibly Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver, but was leaning more towards the idea of shooting up his old school, Simon Fraser, likely harboring some ill will towards the school after his failings as a student further shredded his self-confidence. The problem was, Ryan Grantham appeared to be very well-functioning to those around him. Outwardly, he wasn't really showing any signs that there was a problem. Because of this, nobody ever saw the signs that anything was wrong, and he was free to keep planning these things, to keep buying weapons, and, on a sadder note, to keep suffering. By the end of the month, March 31st of 2020, Ryan was completely consumed by the desire to end his own life, and, to a greater extent, the desire to end the lives of those around him. He came to a decision. He was going to commit an act of mass violence. But he wasn't positive on where. He was still kind of mulling around the ideas. There was a problem, though. He was already concerned with how his mom was going to feel about relatively minor things given the big picture, like smoking weed and dropping out of school. So how was she going to feel if he shot up a school or something? He could only really think of one way to solve this problem, and no, it wasn't to just decide not to go through with it. No, his solution was to end his mother's life peacefully before she could ever find out about what he was about to do. That day, 64-year-old Barbara Grantham was playing the piano at her home in Squamish, completely unaware that anything was amiss. That was when Ryan walked up behind her, pulled a 22 caliber rifle up to the back of her head, and fired a shot. She collapsed there and died on the spot. For reasons unknown, but likely to later use in some sort of online manifesto, Ryan started filming the aftermath on his GoPro camera. In this video, he both confessed to the killing and filmed the body. I shot her in the back of the head. In the moments after, she would have known it was me, he said in the video. After the killing, Ryan decided to relax. He went out to buy some beer and some weed and came back home. That same day, he wrote a journal entry about what he had just done. In that entry, he apologized to the rest of the family, but accepted that, in the end, nobody would understand him. I'm so sorry, Mom. I'm so sorry, Lisa. I hate myself. There's a lot of media of me out there, film and TV, Hundreds of hours of me that can be viewed and dissected. No one will understand, he wrote. After chugging a bunch of beer and smoking a bunch of marijuana, he went to bed. The next day, April 1st, Ryan came back into the room where his mother's body still remained and decided that he should probably clean up a bit. In a somewhat religious manner, he covered the body up with a sheet, placed candles all around it, and then hung a rosary on the piano. It isn't really known why he did this, but I think it's safe to say that he was feeling a fair amount of guilt over what he had just done. However, the guilt didn't really change his plans to move forward with his violent killings. In fact, he was still very much willing to do so. It was time. He pulled out all of his weapons and started really deciding what he was going to do and how he was going to move forward. He decided that he was going to go big, as big as possible. He was going to carry out a couple of acts. He was going to shoot up his old school, after all, but he wasn't going to stop there. He was going to move across the country of Canada, committing violence here and there, until finally moving on to the home of the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, to kill him. Before leaving his home, he started to prepare. He tested weapons on the grounds of his home, including making and testing some homemade Molotov cocktails. He then got onto Google Maps and printed out directions to the Rideau Cottage in Ottawa, where he would finish off the Prime Minister. Afterwards, he drank and smoked for hours as he tried to build up courage for what he was about to do. He packed his car with three guns, a load of ammunition, 12 Molotov cocktails, and his printed map. He then set off on his journey. 
Ryan drove about 200 kilometers or 120 miles toward the town of Hope. However, something happened to him during this time. Maybe it was his sense of guilt finally giving him a bit of clarity, allowing him to grasp what he was really about to do. Whatever it was that caused him to change his mind, he did. He drove out to Vancouver and went to the police station, where he confessed to them that he had murdered someone. Simply, bluntly, he told them, I killed my mother, before turning himself in at the front desk. At some point around this time on the same day, Ryan's sister, Lisa, found the body of their mother. She had gotten worried when, even after multiple attempts to contact both her mom and her brother, she couldn't get through to either of them. She drove herself out to the family home and let herself in, only to find the body. Ryan was taken into custody where he would remain from then on out. Months and months passed as the investigation continued and court dates were set up. During this time, Ryan became involved in a mental health program. He gradually started to improve throughout this program and started to think more clearly. In March of 2021, Ryan appeared in court. At this time, he had brought a note that he had written and told the Vancouver court and Justice Kathleen Kerr, I cannot explain or justify my actions. I have no excuse. It hurts me to think about how badly I've wasted my life. In the face of something so horrible, saying sorry seems so pointless. But from every fiber of my being, I am sorry. His sister, Lisa, made a victim impact statement in which she opened up about how the murder had destroyed both her career and her life in general. She made it known that when Barbara was killed, she had been battling cancer for quite some time. Lisa got very close with her during this time, saying that she had felt that her mom had become her best friend. She told the court, It breaks my heart she struggled so hard only to be murdered by her own son. She was vulnerable and Ryan gave her no chance to defend herself. It pains me to know that he was a danger to her life. She expressed that she had no doubt that her brother was and is a dangerous person. She specifically said that she feared his possible release from prison. As court usually goes, things dragged on for quite some time. Finally, in June of 2022, Ryan's sentencing began. Ryan's lawyer argued on his behalf, saying that the crime mainly occurred due to his mental illness, mainly an intense, prolonged period of clinical depression. However, the prosecutors weren't really convinced that this was really a good argument. Plenty of people struggle with clinical depression without killing anybody. They said that Ryan committed a heartbreaking breach of trust against someone who had been an excellent parent that he had no reason to fear. Two psychiatric reports had been done in Ryan's case. The Crown Prosecutor, Michaela Donnelly, said that, yes, there was a consensus that Ryan had been going through a very rough bout of depression in the time leading up to the murder, although he appeared to be completely normal to those around him. The reports also showed evidence that, at that time, he did have an urge to commit violent acts both against himself and against others. He had also been battling strong feelings of both self-loathing and guilt, and also a sense of shame when it came to how his mom might feel when she found out about all of his drug use and his dropping out of school. Both of the reports stated that he had a cannabis disorder and an unhealthy relationship with marijuana. The reports listed the reason for the murder as simply that Ryan wanted to spare his mother from witnessing what he was about about to commit. He put the crosshairs on the back of her head, closed his eyes, and pulled the trigger, said the Crown Prosecutor. She said that, while it may seem that Ryan was killing his mother out of a sense of kindness, not wanting her to see the horrible things he was about to do, that it was a profoundly selfish act in the end. Mr. Grantham was seeking to save his mother from something he was going to do. That is something different than altruism, said the Prosecutor. During the hearings, the court heard all about how Ryan had actually rehearsed the killing to himself beforehand. They saw the video he took in which he confessed to the murder and showed the crime scene on camera. They then heard excerpts from his journal and police reports in which he detailed his plans to commit mass violence and murder the Prime Minister. His reason for wanting to do so, however, wasn't made clear at any point during the trial. When deciding what to charge him with, the prosecutor said that the circumstances warranted first-degree murder rather than some lesser charge like manslaughter. Not only did he rehearse the murder, but he had many chances that day to change his mind and reconsider what he was about to do. However, he continued every step of the way. He loaded his gun, sat on the stairs for about 15 minutes as he planned out his next steps, aimed the gun to the back of her head, and followed through. 
If convicted, a life sentence was a sure thing. The only variable really came down to whether or not he would get parole and how long it would take for him to get it. The prosecutors were hoping that it would be 17 to 18 years at the least. While all of this was going down, Ryan had already been in custody for a good two and a half years, and law enforcement was looking at putting him into a more permanent facility as all of this dragged on. Then, just a few weeks ago, as of the making of this video, in September of 2022, everything was settled. Ryan pled guilty to a lesser charge of second-degree murder, despite originally being charged with first-degree murder. Either way, this charge still carried out a mandatory life sentence, so that aspect hadn't really changed. The criminal code states that the minimum period of time it would take for Ryan to be eligible for parole would be 10 years. With that life sentence being a sure thing, the argument about parole dragged on. Ryan's defense continued to argue that he had battled with anxiety, depression, and the self-ending ideolation for months leading up to the murder, which were all exacerbated by isolation, copious amounts of weed, and a steady stream of gore videos from the deep web. The prosecutors argued that Ryan shouldn't be eligible for parole for 18 years, while the defense argued that 12 years seemed a bit more fair. They also tried to get him placed into a non-maximum security prison, claiming that his small stature would definitely make him a target. In fact, they brought this up multiple times. Since that kept coming up, I looked up how tall Ryan is, and according to Google, he's about 5 foot 7 and 140 pounds, so make of that as you will. In the end, Ryan Grantham was sentenced to life in prison. Justice Kerr said that there were mitigating circumstances involved in her sentencing decision, mainly the fact that Ryan did seem genuinely sorry and remorseful about his actions from the beginning. Ryan's lawyer told CTV that Ryan wasn't shocked about the sentencing at all. I think he anticipated what the judge gave him as a sentence, he said. I think he's very apprehensive about the whole thing. He's a fairly tiny person, and to go to the prison system, I'm sure it's a daunting and scary thought for him. In the end, it was decided that he would eventually be eligible for parole in about 14 years. In a final statement, Justice Kerr said that the statements from Ryan's loved ones, mainly his sister, really showed the life-shattering impact of the murder. She said that his only saving grace was that he realized what he had done and didn't continue on with his plans of mass murder. Ryan has continued his psychiatric treatment while in jail, and it has been said that he continues to show improvement. He's done everything he could do in prison. Uh, he's taken every possible course. He's attended counseling as much as he possibly could. I think there's good hope to believe that he could be rehabilitated. Fellow actors that worked on projects alongside Ryan haven't spoken out on this issue very much. However, a few have, such as Riverdale actress Lily Reinhardt. In response to all of the articles out there referring to Ryan as a Riverdale actor, she stated simply, We do not claim him. Thank you. When it comes to Justin Trudeau, his team and his social media accounts still haven't responded to the case in any way. Canada has a very low rate of gun violence in comparison to the United States, and that makes Ryan's crimes and plan to commit more crimes stand out even that much more. It's no doubt that this is going to be a topic of discussion when it comes down to ongoing conversations about both mental health and gun control within the country. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you don't mind, give it a like, that always helps out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you like content like this. And feel free to follow me on social media, because you know how YouTube is with channels like this. I mean, if this channel were to ever go down, that would probably be the only place you'd ever hear about it. I also have a Patreon account, which I keep linked down in the description below, where you can get videos early, ad-free, and uncensored, so check that out if you're interested. Speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We've got Starfade. Astral, Raven, Grack, Salad, Kevin, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Wafranz, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Marsh, Buffazerk, Rensenstein, Kim Peek, Lex Luther, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Maine, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You guys are all the best. By far, in good amounts of stuff. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.